Hello Aggies and welcome to Spark, where we bring some of the stories of Davis's brightest to you. And today I'd like to introduce to you our very first guest on Spark, Miss Robin Huey. So, hey. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, of course. And I know that a lot of the viewers are really excited to learn more about your story. And so I think that, you know, let's start from the very beginning and maybe so people have more of an understanding or a context of who you are. Tell us a bit about yourself, you know, who was Robin growing up and what did that look like? Well, I grew up in San Francisco. I was born and raised there. I never moved, uh, so I spent my entire life living in one home in okay. one city. Yeah. Uh, what did I look like? <laughs> or what was I yeah. like? What was that like? Yeah. I grew up as an only child, so I guess I spent a lot of time with myself. Mm. Um, I really loved animals, and I like I had really unusual pets. <laughs> did you have like a favorite um, like memory or anything from your childhood that you kind of cling to today or anything that you remember that was really vivid about where you lived? I think what was interesting growing up was because I was in the same neighborhood and my school is in my neighborhood also that I actually like live in a very like bubbled sort of environment. Oh, okay. And I um, went to a high school that was in like the inner part of San Francisco, like the, okay. near the Tenderloin. So I was exposed to a lot of different like social issues like homelessness for like the first time like I was experiencing it on mm. a daily basis and I would see it um, and it started like changing things about mm. how I thought about the world. Were you always involved in the community? Like what was that like for you? Or did it kind of, did you kind of get exposed to community activism when, when mm. you attended UC Davis? It's interesting because I have like a very introverted personality. Mm. So a lot of how I am now isn't what I was before. Because growing up, I was always like really quiet and shy. Mm. Um, like I guess even in high school, but in high school I was more involved, but I wasn't yeah. actually used to being out there mm. doing like community related activities. Um, and I think what changed when I got to Davis, I, I think like the pepper spray incident actually impacted mm. me a lot. Mm -hmm. Cause I was, that was my first quarter here. I was animal science. Um, but I was in Technocultural Studies 1, mm. and I had Bob Ostertag as my professor. Um, and he was very out, he was one of the most outspoken professors during that time. And that started, you know, I guess changing how I was like experiencing the world and mm. how I was like viewing things. Um, and I started wanting to like teach myself about different social issues and like self educating myself. Um, and I got even more involved on campus. Like I was introduced to Bridge that year at yeah. the Student Recruitment Retention Center. Um, I started going to more like org, like student organization meetings and things just started like rolling from yeah. there. You talked a lot about like some of the positions that you held, right? Being a mm -hmm. part of like Bridge and then doing, going to different meetings. Yeah. What was, when did the decision to go into student government happen for you? In my second year, I was actually asked to run for Senate. Okay. Um, oh, you were asked to run. Yeah. Uh, but then I declined because that was the same year um, I was doing the portfolio process to get into landscape architecture. Okay. So I was like, yeah, I can't handle that right mm -hmm. now, but I understand why you're asking me and why, or like why I was being encouraged to by the community. But for myself personally, um, I felt that I couldn't do it at the time. Yeah. But it got stuck in my head. Yeah, um, yeah. And I ended up interning uh, Senator, for Senator Allison Sagala. Mm. Um, and not expose me to more of ASUCD. So then from that point, after the processing, after you went through the process of getting into landscape architecture, mm -hmm. which you did, right? So now yeah. you're a landscape architect major. When was that, like, when did you say to yourself, okay, now I'm going to do Senate? So that was my third year. Okay. What happened was the fall quarter of my third year, I was a coordinator for Bridge. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. yeah. So I went from intern to an actual like coordinator position. Yeah. Um, and what was also happening, what had also happened was Typhoon Haiyan. And during that time, um, we were trying to rally together community for like support. Yeah. Um, for like to be part of like the relief efforts. And when we went to ASUCD for support, um, I don't think it was me that went but it was met with a lot of like negativity and like hostility. Mm. Like they didn't care at all, basically. And that like made me really angry because this was an issue that was actually like affecting different students. Um, and we even went 
all the way up to like student affairs to mm -hmm. get support. And they mm -hmm. actually like responded. Mm -hmm. But it was that response from ASUCD that made a lot of us really angry. And that really pushed me because I was like, I don't think any student should be met with this hostility mm -hmm. or this like lack of regard. Yeah. Um, and I felt that like something needed to change. Like hardly anyone at the time like really cared, like really, really cared about the issues that are happening in different communities on campus. So then that's what pushed me to run the winter quarter of my third mm. year. Okay. And so, you know, for a lot of people, they may, they may not be aware of what like a senator does and mm -hmm. what that kind of looks like. But can you walk me through like a <laughs> typical day that Robin had at Senate yeah. <laughs> as a senator? Like what, did, what, did that, what did that look like for you? Um, let's see. When you become a senator, you're actually going to a lot of commission meetings. Um, you have a lot of Senate responsibilities, like doing interviews for different positions mm -hmm. for different units on, like in ASUCD. And sometimes meetings would fall over class, and I would be in this place where it's like, well, this meeting's super important, but class is super important. Like, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. And so, how do you do? You feel like you, as a senator, represented your community as well. I think I tried my best. Mm. A lot of times I wasn't sure how that representation would happen, um, but a lot of it became this thing where during Senate meetings or during discussions um, or meetings with administrators, what that turned into was me making sure that they knew about a specific community or a specific student organization. So it was a lot of like sharing of resources um, and making known that there are there's like amazing work that other students are doing on campus. To that extent, I think I did a good job of. Was there like a, a specific moment or a specific accomplishment or anything in general about like that Senate experience of yours that really impacted you? I would have to say the entire experience in the moment, like I don't know what was like really, how it was impacting me, mm -hmm. um, but it, it set off a lot of things for me in terms of like self-awareness um, and understanding like how people, people's perceptions of me were changing. Um, so it taught me a lot about like human, like interpersonal connections yeah. with people. My first quarter as a senator was also very interesting because uh, there's a lot going on. Um, the Cinco de Drinco incident. Oh yes. Um, there was divestment. There was crazy budget hearing. Those are all huge yeah. issues at that time. And I was still working for the Student Recruitment Retention Center. Um, and I was still, you know, a student. I'm a full-time student, mm -hmm. landscape architecture student, like four-hour studios. Yeah. So I don't know how I did that quarter, <laughs> but I did that quarter. But it really, like, affected me, like, in terms of my health. Mm. And then I was later diagnosed with clinical depression. Mm. So this was all during my Senate term. Uh, and it was like, it was literally being a senator that pushed me to that point. With all that had happened to you, when you decided to run for vice president, what was going on in your head in that moment? It's really a lot of me trying to, it was me trying to challenge the perception that even though like I struggle with depression, that I could still do things. Mm -hmm. And when I was diagnosed, I was really scared. And also keep in mind that I was in a very like fragile um, like state. And this yeah. was this was before the decision. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of my like thoughts were like, oh my gosh, do I have to drop out of school? Um, and when I actually had a couple people like suggest that to me, that like really impacted me because I even like dropped out of a class. So I refuse to like be in this like box mm -hmm. that people place me in. Yeah. Um, and I was also like isolating myself from other people as well. So a lot of when I ran was like through my experience with like my academics, um, like I really and like handling my mental health and seeing how the university reacted to the things I wanted to do. I was like, I feel like this is an area that this campus actually needs to improve upon. So you won. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> it was you like won. the least competitive election right, ever. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. But that win, did you feel that? Did you experience that win for yourself? No, I actually didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that was because I was still, I didn't realize it. Um, There's so much stuff happening, but I was still in like a depressive episode. 
um, and I actually could not feel anything all winter quarter. Um, I was also, I was part of um, PYC, Filipino Youth Conference, and I was a counselor. But when I was actually like, you know, doing everything for Mentoring it, the younger students, and mentoring, the younger high school. I couldn't feel happiness the entire quarter. Mm. I was like, this is very strange. How long was that process for you till you decided to resign from your position? It took a month for me to realize that something wasn't right. Um, and it was this thing where it was like, yeah, I know I, I knew I could do it, but what was happening was like, I wasn't addressing my own needs. Mm -hmm. um, and I, in my spring quarter, when I was, like when I resigned, um, there were other things going on. Like my senior project for landscape architecture got approved. And I was like, wow, like I want, like I can't believe this happened. But then it was like, wait, I have this other thing and I have to go to these meetings. Um, and they're like conflicting with what I need to do for my senior project. Mm -hmm. And the question, or like the idea of like, what would I rather be doing right now came up. Um, and I was like under so much stress at the time. Um, and I entered into, I guess, what I would call like my third depressive episode, um, my senior year. And it was so, it was so like terrible that my body kind of shut down. Um, and I, it, it happened like, so fast it was just like bam i was sick immediately and i knew that i wasn't being myself um i couldn't even go to class i was like skipping out of meetings mm. so that's when i knew that i had to resign mm. from that point on what did you do to like find ways to help yourself or was it more of like you couldn't at that moment it wasn't something that you could have done a lot of it was disconnecting myself from my identity as a senator or someone heavily involved in ASUCD because I realized that I had lost myself in a sense um, and I was really feeding into how people expected me to be. Um, so I guess I was put on a pedestal a lot and it was almost, it's a positive thing, you know, to be viewed like in a positive light. Mm. But it's also very dehumanizing. And then sometimes because, you know, because of divestment, it, there's like a lot of hate emails, you know, being sent to me. Um, and there's a lot of like people finding me on social media and sending me, you know, um, like private messages mm -hmm. telling me like what a terrible person I am. Um, and like, they're gonna make sure I never find a job. And these were like people from, you know, all over the United States. And I was like, how are you finding All me? over the United States? Yeah, it was like, there's a guy from like North Carolina who's messaging me um, and I would ignore them. Um, but it was ridiculous. It was so ridiculous. Yeah. And I like, I couldn't deal with it. And I just disappeared off of social media. Mm -hmm. I was just like, I need to find myself yeah. pretty much. When you were diagnosed with depression, mm -hmm. did you tell everyone on your board or did you tell your staff that you had that or was that something that you kept to yourself? I only told the people that I was working with the most. Okay. So I was, <laughs> it's another thing I was involved in. I was part of um, the West Coast Asian Pacific Student Union, Wakapsu. Mm. So they were the first group that I told um, because it was, because I felt the safest telling them because they're all, they identified similar to me. Um, and they were also very like progressively minded or like radically minded. So I knew that they would understand or they were willing to listen. Um, then I told senators that I felt closest to. Mm. Um, I remember telling Armando, who was ASUC president at the time. And then when I opened up to my professors, that was kind of traumatic for me because mm. that's sort of where um, it was like indicated that maybe I should drop out of school. And that was very discouraging for me. So, so after that, I was like, I'm not telling anyone else. At that time when all those different um, hate mail and things were happening and they mm -hmm. were, you were, it was being sent your way, no one knew, not a lot of people knew your story and no. what that was like. Yeah, no one knew. Um, I didn't want to address it. Like I didn't want to like actualize it. Hmm. You know, I kind of just kept it to myself. Yeah. And I never actually like processed through it until actually really recently. 
And I decided, like, I'm going to delete this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so, so then that brings me to, you know, the next point is kind of like, why now? You know, why? Because mm -hmm. when you resigned, mm -hmm. right, um, your reasoning for resignation, it wasn't, it, you didn't stipulate or you didn't officially say that it was due to depression, correct? No. No. Um, you disclosed it due to personal reasons. Like, that health. was your health reasons. <laughs> Just health. So, yeah. why, why now? I feel that, like, it's important for it to be shared because it's a narrative about, like, student leadership that mm. isn't very acknowledged. Um, because there's students, like, everywhere who do so much for this campus, who really, like, care about the community, but they aren't actually acknowledged. Or they don't know, like, people don't know what they're going through as, like, a human being because sometimes people are viewed as their positions first. Mm. But... I guess sometimes like the question of like, how would you like to be viewed doesn't get asked. Um, and that also sort of plays into other areas, not just student leadership, but even when un we understand our own identities um, and how we wish to be identified. So I guess like coming out like right now about like what happened, um, it's also like a message about self-care. Mm. And I think self-awareness is so important um, learning to care for yourself so you can care for others is super important. Um, and I also think it like helps develop empathy. Mm. I think that, you know, your message is really strong and really clear. So you mentioned something about a lot of people not knowing or not asking how someone wants to be viewed, mm -hmm. right? And what that perspective looks like. So I guess I can end with, you know, the Robin now, <laughs> how do you want to be viewed? How what do, do you I want mean? people to see? when they meet and experience you? I guess right now who I am and how like I want to be viewed is someone who is more interested in design, um, but I see it as something different. Mm. Um, I'm like combining my past experiences and like figuring how to move forward with my, how, you know, sort of like my newfound yeah. or my rediscovered identity, I guess. Um, but it's like a lot of like design combined with activism, sort of like how design can improve human life. So <laughs> do you, is there anything else that you'd like to share maybe with to any of your supporters that know, that had known you, but maybe didn't know that you were going through that, you know, that you had those difficult battles that you experienced? To really address like different issues like mental illness, mental health, um, like, you know, racism, classism, sexism, et cetera, all the isms, um, it really, like, it can begin from just yourself and, like, how you view other people, even how you view yourself, um, because oppression against self is an actual thing, mm -hmm. and that is, like, a huge thing that people don't get acknowledged for, is, like, taking care of themselves mm -hmm. and getting to know themselves, um, and that can actually, like, do a lot for those around you. Um, it's a very like complex thought, but it makes a lot of sense when it actually begins and like every day you're asking yourself like, how am I doing today and how is this affecting those around me mm. and how am I treating other people? That's it. That's <laughs> all I have. Thank you so much for being our first guest on this new segment. Yeah. And I, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so. for having me. Thank you.